Jung Seed has all your summer gardening needs, including seeds, plants, flowers, bulbs, and supplies. We provide the highest quality products with satisfaction guaranteed. Jung Seed is a family owned and operated company for over 113 years. Use code 10FG20 to receive 10% off your order at jungseed.com. That's J U N G S E E D. Dot com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants. Just not always the same ones. You know, did you forget your line, Danielle? It's- no, no, I did not. I was right on cue. What the hell? Hey, there's heard- a delay. There's a delay, you know, with this remote recording. You got to give me like a half a beat to get my act together. <laughs> Who are okay. you? Who are you? Uh, I'm Steve Aiken. I'm the editor of Fine Gardening Magazine. You should say I'm the cranky editor of Fine Gardening Magazine. And I'm Danielle Sherry. I'm the joyful, cute one of the team. I'm also the senior editor. <laughs> what is your What does your coffee cup say? <laughs> I'm a bleeping ray of sunshine. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and it should be noted that Steve actually pointed that coffee cup out to me, and uh, it suggested that I had to be the one to actually buy that coffee cup. So I did, and it's so appropriate. <laughs> yes. So we're yeah. we're recording in the morning, which normally we don't do. And you are a morning person, though, so I expect you to actually be the peppy one today, as opposed to me. Um, yeah, normally my co- my I, 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 my caffeine is kicked in um, by now, and, and I'm it- not sure that it, that it has. Just <laughs> hmm. yeah, much better, much better. Okay, yeah, let's talk. Let's let's go. go. Let's yeah. do it. Well, so this yeah. is an interesting episode because it actually was a a last minute entry of a topic. We set our topics pretty far in advance, and um, it was because we got a listener question in, and um, it really it, it sparked a discussion between you and I. Correct? Uh, if that's the story you want to tell, sure. <laughs> well, what story do you want to tell? Uh, someone sent in a question. It was a good question. I sent it to you. Said, you know, should we do this? You said yes, and so now we're doing it. All right. So, should we listen to the question from our listener Elizabeth? Yes, we should. Okay. Hi, Fine Gardening crew. My name is Elizabeth, and I have a 10-month-old son who inspires this question. When I was a kid, my earliest memories of the garden are exploring a wild brush on the side of our property, squeezing snapdragons so that they would talk, and watching the bursting impatient seed pods in the fall with my brother. I'd love to hear your ideas on how to create a safe and magical space for kids to engage with the garden, whether that's design or plants that are particularly fun to interact with. So I think it's an interesting uh, question that she asked. It's a question we get uh, asked a lot about, and that is, you know, how do I encourage um, my kids to get outside um, and garden? Um, I I am probably the last person who should answer this question since both of my children are seem to be indoor cats. Um, but, uh, you know, who, who knows? Who knows? There's still hope. I mean, when I was their age, I wasn't particularly fascinated by plants. No. Um, so there's still there's still hope. Actually, uh, like I, I recall that I was in fact, gardening was used as a as a weapon against me as a child. You know, like the only time I remember gardening really being involved in my life was when my mom used as a punishment to go out and weed the vegetable garden in July when it was a hundred degrees out. So I I really resented gardening and plants at the beginning of my, of my existence. Yeah. Well, I think, I think human beings are uh, inclined to do like the easiest thing there is. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's usually like staying inside and watching TV um, or playing video games. And we, we sort of have to be forced don't, we have to be forced to do what's good for us a lot of times, um, sure. you know, and so I remember my mom just kicking me out of the house saying, get out of the house. I don't care what you do, but get out of the house. 
Um, and it wasn't because she had some altruistic idea of making me love nature. It was that she wanted to vacuum, you know, and, and didn't need me and my two brothers laying around the house, you know, messing with stuff toys up. And, and stuff. Yeah. You know, um, mom, you're in the way, you know, she's trying to vacuum. Um, she didn't need that. So she, she would kick us outside and, uh, you know, we'd go outside and, Normally, our outside activities are sports. They were not, you know, let's investigate nature um, <laughs> things, but it was, you know, more sport related. But we, you know, we, I guess uh, all three of us uh, created, you know, found a love of the outdoors. We still like being outside. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess it could happen. And so I, I think the impulse now where we don't have these wild open areas and for some reason things um, are different now where you can't just you know, shove your kids out the door, slam it behind them and say, come back at dinner time. Yeah. You know, but which is how a lot of us grew up. That's how I and grew up. Just, yeah. Don't come back until it's dark <laughs> and yeah. then I'll feed you. You, <laughs> you would wander around the neighborhood on your bikes, go places. Oh, look, here's, here's a dark trail into the woods. <laughs> What's you? And you would go and you would explore and maybe make a fort down there. Like you did, like now I would be horrified of my children you know, did something like that. Right. I don't know, like, what the difference is. Um, Probably nothing, but, uh, but there were the same dangers yeah, so like, then that there are now, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> You're more um, attentive yeah. at parenting. Yeah. So, so given, given the lack of, of uh, exploration opportunities, what can someone do in the backyard to create um, smaller opportunities to explore, I guess, and to interact with nature? Mm hmm. I guess is, is, is the question. I, I think so. Yeah. Because, you know, she mentioned, which was pretty funny. It, it triggered a, a forgotten memory of mine of the impatience and, you know, the impatient getting the seed pod that if it's just the right, you know, size that you can pinch it and the thing explodes and there's seeds everywhere. And I, I distinctly remember doing that with my cousins, uh, either at my grandmother's or at my aunt's house when when we were very young. I mean, I was probably four or five because it seemed like the impatience were a hedge at that point. So I must have been pretty little. But yeah, it, it, it's things like that that are almost, you know, instead of well, you had said instead of, hey, get outside and enjoy nature. It's more like, hey, come take a take a look at this cool thing, you know, these exploding yeah. seed pods or something along those lines. Yeah. I mean, uh, if, if we have a love of nature now and of being outdoors and of plants, I, it's not because of anything our parents did. No. You know, like they did not encourage that in any way. They just, you know, threw us out of the house and, and we found it. Um, and, and perhaps, um, that's why uh, we're in the state we're in with the environment where so many people are um, not necessarily anti-environment, but every time they see a bug, they think they should spray something. <laughs> right. And, and how do, how do I make my, um, how do I make my landscape something that uh, nothing grows in? Mm -mm. Everything just, everything just stays the same. Yeah. You know, like the grass does not grow. <laughs> The shrubs do not grow because then I'll have to, you know, like, why can't, why can't I have that? Yeah. And so people are really out of, uh, out of touch with nature in terms of, you know, bugs happen. And sometimes that's a good thing. Some people, uh, some people. Yeah. And, and birds, birds are a good thing. And, um, you know, grass turns brown in the summer. Right. That's what happens. You know, uh, that's just how it works. Don't worry. It'll green back up again in the fall. But we're, we're sort of out of tune, I think, with the rhythms of nature. And I think we want to um, help the younger generation find those rhythms again. Well, that's that's definitely that, what it seemed like Elizabeth was getting at. Yeah. Like, how do I? Was, what was, was that all too heady? Well, I yeah. mean, a, a little bit, a little bit. But no, I think that you got at the at the deeper question of, you know, she wants to make sure that, you know, her child doesn't feel like the grass needs to be ultraviolet green, you know, in, in the middle of July. And, you know, the occasional reseeding perennial isn't something to get all crazy about. I think ultraviolet green would be pretty cool for a lawn. <laughs> ultraviolet. Anyway, you, um, you could get that yeah. with a lot of cans of spray paint, but okay. So, so well, my, my advice to, to Elizabeth is to, um, my experience uh, as a parent is that my children will not do anything that I tell them to do. So tell your kids, do not go outside. 
you know, <laughs> reverse psychology at do, best. Do do not do not enjoy nature. Okay, <laughs> there's fresh air out there. Don't you dare go out and enjoy it. And then five minutes later, you'll you'll find them in the backyard. Yeah, doing something. exactly. Um, that's that that might work. Um, Maybe my kids are too smart. My kids are too smart for that. The big okay, fine, you know, <laughs> uh, and and stay inside. The uh, the the other side of that is is that you know you you do your best to have plants in your landscape that instill you to say hey come take a look at this and it might actually leave a lasting impression with that child and where i'm coming from is i think that those are plants that taste good feel good or smell good i mean i think those are the, the yeah. three things that would get me to say to anybody you know my my nieces and nephews my husband Hey, come take a look at this. Um, and I, I think so. Taste good, smell good, um, and feel good were the were the categories I tried to hit on. Yeah, and, and if if there is a plant in there that has like a cool story behind it or something that you can tell a cool story about, mm. um, I, th- I think that helps. I have a I have a rock in my yard that has some weird fungus on it that looks like it has spots. And I remember calling it the cheetah rock. <laughs> uh, well, when the kids were the, when the kids were younger. And telling some story about like that's the cheetah that you know comes out at night and protects the the house or something like that, <laughs> um, and they, they were fascinated with that, you know, for for like a weekend. And uh, um, like the more we can do stuff like that, I think it makes nature kind of cool. Absolutely. You know? So something, something you want to go out and look at. So with that being said, did you did you pick a plant that might have a cool story in your in your array of kids plants? No, I didn't. Oh, geez. <laughs> No. You know, uh, I, I couldn't. I set up that perfect transition, and you screwed me. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think it's it, I think it's a good example. But like uh, a lot of the stories I have uh, behind plants, I can't quite confirm. Yeah, and then they take too long to tell, so it's like you know, forget it. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, what about what about feel good, taste good, smell good? Any plants that well, felt- you know my my go to plant, and even as my kids get older, they they still think this one's kind of cool. Um, and they actually know what it is, um, is lamb's ears. Mm. Um, so, um, you know, it, for people who don't know lamb's ears, it's got these uh, wide um, green, extremely fuzzy leaves. They they feel like a pillow and they're fun to touch and rub. Um, gets to be about you know six inches tall, um, unless it flowers. Some people think it's kind of ugly when it flowers. I think it's kind of ugly when it flowers. Mm. But it has like these, this, it makes this mat of soft gray green leaves. Um, super easy to grow, likes it dry. Um, you know, it doesn't like too much humidity. I mean, we can grow it in the Northeast. Um, doesn't like wet winters. We can grow it in the Northeast, but it usually looks like heck by, by March. Um, but it comes right back. Um, zones, uh, four to eight on it. Um, you know, it's going to bloom from May to July. Like I said, it gets these weird, you know, pointy, you know, Upright uh, of flowers with like I feel like purple or pink or something like that. Um, I cut them off. It's a full sun plant, super easy to grow, mm-hmm. fun to touch. Like it's the type of thing that uh, kids like to stop by and, and, and touch the leaves. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and part of it is that you know lambs. Everybody likes lambs and lambs ears, and it's 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 fun to say. It's easy to remember. Uh, that's how I introduced the plant to them, not as Stacky's Byzantina, mm-hmm. you know, but as lamb's ears. I mean, that's one of the good things about common names is that they, they help people relate, you know, to them. So lamb's ears, snapdragons, you know, mm-hmm. th- these things are, are cool things uh, as opposed to Stacky's Byzantina or what's what, what's what's uh, snapdragons? Like? It's like antirinum, antirinum. Some, something or other, yeah. you know, that sounds like something you come down with, antirinum. <laughs> Like, you know, oh, Billy can't come out to play today. He's got a case of the enterinum. Oh, you know, no. You can't. Yeah. Oh, no. Right. See, it doesn't, doesn't sound good. But Snapdragon, you know, sounds cool. Yeah, it does. You're you're right. You're yeah. totally right. So that's like, yes, that tactile, you know, it, it's the feely. It's the touchy-feely plants. And that's a great weed-suppressing plant, too, I will say. You know, if you've got a problem area in full sun and you just don't have to want to have to worry about it, Plant some lamb's ears. Those things multiply. I don't know how they exactly spread. Is it by like, is it stoloniferous? Or do they, do they? Spread? No, because stolen, stolons are above ground. Okay. But I um, thought they, I, mean, 
I maybe. Yeah, I thought they had like maybe. a weird, I don't know, brownish looking thing. Anywho, they spread um, and, and they really do form these weed suppressing mats. And um, I've seen them used very, very effectively as a, you know, tough as nails ground cover. So yeah, lamb's ears is a, is a good one. And I agree. Cut those flowers off. God, those are ugly. I don't know why. <laughs> it's like, why bother? <laughs> Okay, uh, ed- let, let's insert an editing note here. We're just going to go back and cut off everything you said after you're right. You're totally right. <laughs> we're just going to cut. No, we're going we're gonna to cut. We're going to go to the music, no. and then we'll go we'll go to the British part, no. and then that's no, no, that's it. That's it. No, I feel like this is going to be this is going to be a very positive episode. Actually, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if you'll hold up the positivity end of things. When my plant, my first one that I'm going to choose is on the taste good section. So I picked an edible, but I picked an edible flower because I remember when my nephews were young, their mind, or at least my youngest nephew, their mind was, his mind was totally blown that you could eat flowers. And I just remember this clearly of, you know, walking through the vegetable garden and it was like, oh yeah, tomatoes. I know you can eat those. Oh yeah. Blueberries. No, you can eat those. But then when I picked a nasturtium and just ate it, his mind was absolutely blown. So, you know, my favorite nasturtium that I've been growing for years is Empress of India. It's nothing groundbreaking or earth shattering, but the cool thing about it is it's got these, you know, small disky looking leaves that almost look like miniature lily pads. And um, Empress of India, the foliage is kind of purpley. So it's a little bit more attractive as a, you know, edible. And the flowers are this dark, dark, deep red, almost a garnet color red. And uh, the flowers are edible. The leaves are edible. Uh, The leaves are a little more mild than the flower. It tastes like a radish. It's got a little bit of a peppery, but not hot. So, you know, it's not something that the kids will be like, "Ah." Um, and I, the, the leaves are great for rolling and kind of making little sushi rolls with, or, you know, little spring rolls, you get that little peppery thing and it's kind of cool. It's fun. You know, you're making your own little like cool rolls and, uh, you know, the flowers toss into salad, something like that. But the other cool thing about this, and it is an annual, it needs full sun, a little more dwarf and compact for a nasturtium. But these things germinate quickly. So this is something that you can go outside. It's got a, like 99% germination rate. They're large seeds. So kids can pop them into the ground. And then it's almost instant gratification. Within seven days, those seeds that they planted are sprouting. And I feel like that's an important thing with kids. You know, the, the whole plant a seed and, you know, wait two weeks before you see any signs of life you know, they totally forget that they even did it in the first place. So that's another thing that I think is, you know, if you're, if you're going to do seed starting with kids, um, you need something for instant gratification, but yeah, I'm just, um, I'm a big fan. I, I feel like nasturtiums are a, are a good gateway, gateway edible flower, basically. Yeah. Uh, cool looking flowers, uh, cool looking foliage is a round thing. And you forgot to mention when you're talking about flavors is, is the taste of the aphids, um, oh. that, that are usually cover, <laughs> uh, the, the, the backs of the leaves. Um, oh, I not quite as, not quite as crunchy as you might think. Um, but they, they do add a little, uh, that's my only problem with nasturtiums is that they're usually covered with, with aphids. Well, um, they, you, know. you know, usually it, later in the season, they can get aphids. But if you have a healthy environment and a healthy garden, generally, they will also be covered with ladybugs and uh, beneficial insects that are eating the aphids. So there you somebody's, go. Uh, somebody's got to eat the aphids. There yeah. you go. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, I have I have aphids right now on on a plant, and the we have the ants uh, are guarding mm. uh, the aphids because they they enjoy the honeydew that the aphids um, you know create. Um, so there's ho- there's this whole like battle going on, um, and that too can be cool for kids. Like, hey, look, yeah. you know, here are the bad guys, and here are their guards, and the, <laughs> you know the good guys are trying to get there, but they have to get past you know the evil creatures, these giant ants, um, to get to. Uh, what they want. I, so, I, but yeah, nasturtium is great, easy to grow. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, I have an edible too, because I think edibles are a great way to encourage kids to get out in the garden. Like, hey, you can eat that. It's important to point out that you need to point out to your kids, they can't just eat anything. 
True. Oh, look, it's a berry. You should eat that. That's not a good idea. Oh, no, look, no. it's a leaf. You can eat that. Yeah, you have to teach them how to identify yes. the things that can be eaten. Um, that's that's important. Uh, but one of my, my son's favorite plants that I make sure to plant every year is the sun gold cherry tomato. Um, just, to, you know, everyone knows what a tomato looks like. Everyone knows what a cherry tomato looks like. Uh, I'm not going to describe it. Um, sun gold uh, are yellow uh, cherry tomatoes that ripen to an orange mm-hmm. um, and are, are probably some of the sweetest uh, cherry tomatoes I have ever had. Um, and it to date, ch- uh, cherry tomatoes are pretty much the only vegetable my son will eat. Um, <laughs> and so we grow we, we grow uh, sun gold cherry tomatoes and he, he eats them like crazy. Uh, it's a very prolific, um, you know, you get tons of fruit off of it. Um, and also to date, I don't think any sun gold tomato has ever, ever made it into our house uh, (laughs) because my son is always eating them right off the vines. And if he's not, then I am. Um, And we learned, you know, long ago how to communicate in the special language that we have created. um, That that is how one communicates with a mouth full of sun gold tomatoes. (laughs) So we can both understand uh, what one is saying. Uh, when you talk with uh, a mouthful of cherry tomatoes, if if you're gonna if you want your kids to be out there, you know, give them something to eat. That's always a great way to go. Mm-hmm. Sun gold cherry tomatoes do not taste like anything healthy. They taste like candy. They, they are do. so good, um, and you, you you can't go wrong with them. No, you can't. And the cool thing is that it is an indeterminate tomato. I mean, this thing will get large and vining, but it's a great, I think I've seen it uh, or pictures of it in your garden where you don't always grow it in a typical, you know, vegetable garden setting. You know, it looks like sometimes you stick a plant in the middle of your ornamental beds and this thing kind of vines all over the place. You get these almost grape-like clusters of fruit too. So it's, it's, easy to spot them. You know, with another tomato, if you stuck that in the middle of an ornamental bed, you might never find the tomatoes because, you know, you're in there kind of, you know, trying to, I don't know, with a machete, bushwhack your way to the tomatoes. But these kind of, you know, almost drape down like grapes and are easy to get to. Um, and it's, it's, it's a really pretty plant too, just overall, uh, on top of the fact of tasting like candy corn, basically. <laughs> tastes like candy corn. I think it does. They're so sweet. I hate candy corn. They're so yeah, I hate candy corn. It tastes like sugar, pure sugar. That's what it tastes like. It's delicious. <laughs> so, well, yeah. okay. Right. I'm going to circle back because, um, you know, we were talking at first about, you know, it feels good. And I want to talk about, I kind of have a plant that's in that same vein as your lamb's ear, but I picked um, Salvia Argenti which is the silver sage Argenta, the silver sage. And there's a new variety of that called, or a newer variety called Artemis. Um, And basically this is, you know, a a sage that looks like it, or a lamb's ear that looks like it ate its Wheaties this morning. It's bulky. It's got huge leaves to it that can get up to be football size. They're silver, a lot like your lamb's ears. They're a little bit more corrugated. Um, It just looks really, really cool, like a fuzzy giant hosta. And Artemis' claim to fame is that it's supposedly a little more rot resistant, which is great because, um, you know, wet winters, this is a perennial, actually it's a biennial. So the first year you get all that really cool, fuzzy, gotta touch it, use it as a pillow, I think you said. And then the second year, a little less foliage, not as impressive of a plant and then sends up this giant spike, almost, uh, you know, two feet in the air of flowers and then it dies. So, you know, it's, it's a short lived, uh, a short lived adventure, two years long, but it's totally worth it in the meantime. And, you know, this is a full sun plant ordinarily. I've had real trouble ever getting it to come back because I think of the winter wet, it just doesn't like that. Um, but yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to try this newer variety that supposedly is a little bit more tolerant of winter wet. But yeah, I mean, that is just a plant that 
you know, hey, I'm a big kid. I just want to get over there and like kind of rough it up a little bit because it's just really tactile, really fuzzy, just kind of cool. Yeah, it's um, it's it, as lamb's ears are kind of the size and shape of lamb's ears. Uh, one of the other names for for this salvia is hobbit's foot because it's like <laughs> this big, it's long, wide foot. You know, that's kind of that's kind of furry. Um, it, it's it's bigger than lamb's ears. It's furrier and just as soft as lamb's ears. Um, it's probably better than lamb's ears. Edit that part out, um, but. <laughs> A great plant, and I've grown it in containers um, five or six times. And for some reason, I, I think it's because I don't always see it when I'm shopping for my plants for my containers mm. uh, that I, I tend to forget about it. Mm. And when you just mentioned it, I'm like, why have I not grown that in a couple of years? <laughs> um, super easy to grow. Yeah, again, likes it dry. Um, I have had it over winter. The, the one year I planted it in the ground. Oh, you um, did? I have had it over winter. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it, it didn't recede or anything like that. Um, it was it was kind of an accident, to be honest. Now, with you. were you growing uh, the straight species, the Argentia? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. All right. Have you have I, you I, I, ever tried that other that newer variety, Artemis? I hadn't I hadn't even heard of it. Okay. Until you just mentioned it. So as far as I know, you could be making it up. <laughs> um, could very well be. But but yeah, great plant. Um, so if your kids are maybe a little bigger and want something that's cooler than, than lamb's ears. Like that's a good one. Salvia Argentia. Um, oh wait, the, stop. The, the, that's where the episode the, ends. I picked a no, cooler but the, plant. The, the, the advantage of lamb's ears is that they're perennial. Mm, true. Very true. Yeah. You get a bigger bang for your buck with the silver sage, but it's only a two year proposition as opposed to yeah, yeah a true perennial. Mm-hmm. True. True. So this is like Freaky Friday all over again. Well, actually, we are recording on a Friday because I told you you were right. And then you said my plant was cooler than the plant you mentioned. What is going on in this universe? I don't know. We're, we're in the morning as opposed to the afternoon. I don't, uh, I don't know what's happening here. Something um, is strange is happening. For, hurry up. Tell, tell me another plant so I can disagree with it and uh, tell you that you're wrong. I know. I, 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 might, uh, I might accidentally smile or something and like, who knows what's going to happen. <laughs> Well, you know, I, when we were doing this, I asked my kids, like, which which of my plants do you remember? Or, do, you know, can you think of it off the top of your head? Mm-hmm. And um, my son was like, oh, that, that one that looks like uh, that looks like an octopus that I have to walk by all, all the time. Uh, he's the aloe. They actually knew the name, the aloe. Ah. Um, because I have, I grow aloe vera in a container on our front walkway that he has to walk by when he, you know, when he goes to school. Um, and he thinks it looks like an octopus. And it, and it kind of does. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so aloe vera, if anyone only knows it from, you know, it's, it's skincare properties. Um, it's just a wonderful, uh, uh, upright succulent that has like, um, I don't know, not spikes, but like uh, upright sword shaped, um, fleshy leaves, um, mm-hmm. wider, at, yeah, wider <laughs> at the base, um, narrow at the ends, um, uh, like a nice light lime green uh, that can turn kind of orangey mm-hmm. in, in more sun. Um, it's a succulent, so it's super easy to grow. You don't have to touch it at all. Um, and like when you when you cut it off, it has like this goop in there, which mm-hmm. can, can can soothe poison ivy, um, yeah. burns, stings, um, uh, which is cool. And mm-hmm. the, the, you know, kids think it's neat. Like, oh, they can touch this. This ew, it's this weird goopy thing. Uh, and and the the other thing that makes it gross is that it smells horrible. Oh yeah. Oh gosh. Aloe really vera, was. aloe vera goop, whatever it's called, sap. I don't know. Smells <laughs> awful. Like oh, this really is does. look. I've I've cut this 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 um, leaf off of the aloe vera. Rub <laughs> it on your skin. It'll make things feel better. But it smells like awful. It smells terrible. Yeah. Um, yeah. They can get to be about three to, three to four feet high, but they're not hardy. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, and, but easy and, to overwinter. Super easy to overwinter. I bring them inside, put them in a sunny window, and forget about them. Um, yeah. they're, they're 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 so easy. The biggest problem I've had with with aloe vera is putting it back out in the spring, mm-hmm. where it goes from the dim light of my house to the bright sunshine of out of outdoors. Um, so you mm-hmm. sort of have, sort of have to harden it off to the outdoors. Um, yeah. I, I do this with all my succulents. Do you do that with yours? I, I do, but okay. So for instance, I finally got my agaves outside yesterday. So, you know, we're, we're talking in the same category here and I chose it's, it's, a, a cloudy it's, it's, day, but that's it's, about it. 
But I've, I, you know, I try to gradually get them acclimated. And by the way, it's mid June. You just have yours out. Mine have been out, out for months. Um, I know. <laughs> and I try to get mine gradually uh, uh, acclimated. Uh, but then I tend to, you know, I'll put them in sun for an hour, but then I'll forget. And then I'll wake I mean, up the ne- I'll wake up the next day and be like, oh, oh I was supposed to, and the, the the plant is fine, you know. I mean, that's great if you have an aloe plant that's only like you know a foot tall. But I've got agaves that are three and a half by four feet wide. I mean, yeah, I'm not I'm not dragging that in and out anytime. I'm lucky if I get it out to begin with without being impaled. <laughs> right. So um, all your bragging aside, you could you could uh, <laughs> you could put it in a shady spot. You know, yes, to, to, and then yes. and then like you know, move it and into the sun for a little, and, and then but like you just scooch it into the sunlight and scooch it back. You know, <laughs> it's no big deal. I have to get you know. I was thinking I should do a, a shade cloth or like floating row cover at some point. Like that would be it because once I muscle them into place, I'm not bringing them in and out. So once I muscle them into place, I was thinking about this yesterday when I, you know, picked a cloudy day. Now it's sunny as all get out. They're going to burn today. I know they're going to. So, And, and so, but let's be clear. I'm not recommending agaves for children because of their <laughs> deadly spikes. Okay. I'm recommending aloe for its, its funky habit. Anything with like a funky shape, you know, or habit. Yes. And it's yes. fun to touch because it's soft and kind of gushy. It does have like yes. like little teeth on the edge, but they're soft, you know. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. However, remember that garden that we went to, um, not to take away from your aloe, but back on agaves. Remember that really cool garden that we went to in Pennsylvania? Um, I, I think the garden owner's name was Melissa. She had giant agaves, but she she cut the spikes off the end of them that were in her in her. Because she said, oh, her kids skateboarded down Mm -hmm. like the front walkway. So she was like, I can't I can't have them poking an eye out. So I cut the spikes off it. I've seen people put uh, corks. Yep. On the tips. You do something, too. You do something like like decorative. You put like little. I put cranberries on there. And then I I just let them dehydrate onto there. And actually, that does help because then when I move them out in spring, it's, you know, dehydrated cranberries are on the end of them and. They, I don't get poked as much, but you know, well, there you go. When you do get poked, you think it looks like you're bleeding, like like you know, like a stuck pig or something, because there's like red <laughs> juice all over the place. Like, oh my god! <laughs> exactly, exactly. Hey, speaking of red, oh, this is the best transition ever. I have a red plant on my list that really serves no purpose whatsoever, other than holy cow, it just looks cool, um, and that's chenille plant. Um, it is an annual. It is a hanging basket generally is how you see it sold. It is the most ridiculous looking plant ever, but yes. kids go crazy over it. it because it's kind of a weeping habit, small green leaves, but then it gets these fuzzy, long red caterpillars all over it, which are its blossoms. And it's the most hilarious looking plant ever. I mean, like if the Muppet Show ever had like hanging baskets, you know, on their set, they would be chenille plants because this is just the craziest looking plant ever. You want to touch it. Kids like snipping off. When I used to work at the garden center, they would constantly be picking off these red fuzzy looking caterpillars because they're just fun. It's like a, a plant that creates its own stuffed animals. I mean, it's just awesome. Uh, it is actually hardy zones nine to 11. So, you know, if you're listening from Florida, you could grow this year round. Um, but it really is. It's great for hanging baskets. It's partial shade too. So it's not one of those plants that needs full, full, full sun as far as a, you know, a container plant is concerned. Um, moist soil. It's the same as, you know, most of your typical annual it like it's a heavy feeder so it does like a lot of fertilizer but yeah it's a a calpha hispidata but just chenille plant chenille plant is hilarious it makes me laugh every time i see it i mean and if that doesn't say kid plant nothing does (laughs) steve strangely quiet come on i I got nothing that's a great plant. It, it's a it's a plant that should only be grown for the interest of children. It's, <laughs> right? It's, right? It's 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 pretty tacky. It know, is, I gotta say. and and so it's it's fine for kids. Um, yeah, it's it, fun. It, it's, it, it's great for kids. <laughs> but but you know we, we've already covered you know 
the the things that are fun to touch thing. Yeah, but it's not just fun to touch. It's 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 literally you see it from a distance and you just start laughing. I I mean, it brings great joy. You don't have to touch it for it to bring you great joy. All right. All right. <laughs> Chenille plant, everyone. <laughs> All right, so All right. you ditched my chenille plant. You got anything better over there, Mister? Uh, pr- pr- probably not, but I'm going to go anyway. Uh, I, I yeah, I want to say that there are a lot of categories that we're not touching on here, and a lot mm-hmm. of things that you can do um, to to encourage your kids to be outside. Uh, one great thing that I'm not going to talk about is uh, is creating a hiding place. Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. kids love little nooks and crannies where they can get behind and have their own little space. Yep. Um, so like an area behind a shrub, um, where there's like a little flat area where they can sit, you know, and bring their crayons and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So they have their own little area and so they can feel like they're not being seen, even though you can't see them because, you know, you're an adult and you want to know where your kids are. Like that's, that's a great thing to do. There's yeah. also like the, the bean teepee, you can grow beans or, yeah. or really any fast growing vine up like a, a, a a framework of bamboo or, or any, you know, trellis type sticks, you, 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 you grow that, you know, um, you know, three quarters to, uh, you know, a little bit more of the way around the circle and you leave a little opening mm-hmm. and all of a sudden they have a teepee, a place that they can, you know, crawl into, um, and hang out. My mom used to that's, do that with, that's a cool Scarlet, thing too. with Scarlet runner bean, you know, and, and then again, that's a fast germinating bean that you can plant with your kids. And three days later, the plants start coming yeah. up. So create yeah. a bean teepee. And they, and they climb to the top in, in no time. Yes. Interesting that, that that memory did not come up, but you being, know. you know, forced to weed, um, <laughs> you know, uh, did. Um, <laughs> Apparently yeah. I was a little Steve, you know, I only focused on the negative when I was a kid. <laughs> I, had, I had I had Steve-like tendencies when I was younger. <laughs> my, my, my mother always says I was born 40 because like, a, you know, like no fun. You know, yep. like always, you know, I uh, mean, anyway, your mother knows you best. Does she not? I guess. <laughs> Anywho, uh, the last plan I was going to talk about is, is something that uh, Elizabeth touched on uh, in in her thing. You mentioned it a little bit, too. Um, but I want to talk about um, jewel weed or mm. touch me not um, impatience capensis, which is. um a lot of people consider it a weed. It's actually it's actually a native native wildflower to most of the uh, anywhere east of the Rockies, I, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is an impatience, and uh, it gets to be about two feet tall, and has like these orange flowers, like these tubular flowers that narrow at the end, sort of like a, an old gramophone thing. And they're, they're orange. Ooh, good uh, description. Yeah, they're, they're orangey, yellowish, and they've got like uh, spots going into them. Um, and they're, they're, they're really attractive, uh, but kind of weedy They you know, they weave their way up and they're, you know, um, and they spread, but they, they have those seeds, uh, that explode the seed heads that explode when you touch them. That's why it's called touch me not because mm-hmm. you just touch it and they go mm-hmm. and, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I found that great fun, uh, as a kid, yes. um, you see, you see like the, the, the seeds that they're like a coiled spring. That's and when it like pops. A, yeah, when it pops, yeah. it makes a coiled spring. Yeah, well, I can, I can remember my, my mother saying, like, don't touch those because <laughs> the seeds will go everywhere. And so <laughs> two minutes later, there I was, you know, touching them and the seeds going everywhere. Um, and I think it's great. Um, that's a lot of fun. Like, you're, you're interacting mm-hmm. with the plants. And mm-hmm. uh, another cool thing about this this uh, this plant is that they call it jewel weed because water kind of beads up on, on the surface of the leaves uh like ladies mantle mm-hmm. or lotus you know so like you get this and that's why they call it jewel weed and that's another cool thing too um it, it, it is a native um mm-hmm. you can look at it this way or it it is um a weed you know mm-hmm. because it, because it goes everywhere and it's kind of gangly um and it's really not um a thing to work into a garden design um but one of the things w- that we miss and that we would like to encourage our kids is, is are these weedy, unkempt areas where they can go and explore and look at things and press seeds and not worry about where they're, where they're spreading to. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's all a good thing. Um, I did notice that this plant is considered a noxious weed in the state of Washington, you know, on the other mm-hmm. side of the Rockies. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so if you're over there, do a, don't send me letters because I'm acknowledging that it's a problem out there. <laughs> um, also do not grow it. 
uh, but there are there are native uh, impatiens out there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's like impatiens pacifica or something like that. Um, Which you know, will likely you, have you, the same seed pods. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah so you you can grow them. I mean, uh, the the impatiens that they sell now in in the nursery centers, I don't think get seed heads. You know, um, like the the way that you know you did when you were a kid, and the mm-hmm. way I did. You know, like they had their seed heads, and you could you could play just with your normal. Um, you know, mm-hmm. greenhouse impatience. Um, I don't think, I think they've been bred to like ne- never, ever, ever go to seed. Don't mm-hmm. stop flowering. Don't ever, you know, um, <laughs> just, just bloom constantly and then die. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but this, this is, like I said, uh, it's a native, uh, North American native. It prefers wet areas. Yes. And that's where we actually have it down near our test garden uh, in this, this, this wet area where there's like some runoff into, into the stream and there's a giant, uh, mass of it. Um, and it was introduced to me as a weed. I'm like, Oh, that's interesting. And then I, you know, I looked it up and, and the, the native plant folks were like, no, that's a great native plant. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it's you all about the perspective. S- you seem to be on a, like a poison ivy kick because jewel weed was introduced to me as it's actually a natural, uh, when you break the stem, it does the same almost goopy, gelatiny ooze that you get from aloe. But jewelweed, supposedly, I've tried it. I get horrible poison ivy. Uh, helps with poison ivy. It, it takes some of the itch away. It's got the same properties as aloe vera. So you can use it as like a natural, a natural uh, cure, if you will, to poison ivy. I think that it just helps soothe the itching. It doesn't really dry it out or anything, but you'll see a lot of products actually for poison ivy that include jewel weed in the ingredients list, which I think is kind of cool. So you don't recommend it as a poison ivy sufferer. You do not recommend uh, the, the the goo of impatience capensis on your. Yeah. You know, I, I, I get epic poison ivy. So I, you know, basically only Xanfell works for me at this point, but you know, it does, it's a quick fix, you know, Hey, if you're camping and you got no Xanfell, yes, break off some jewel weed, rub it all over your body and maybe it'll help you sleep at night, but that's about it. <laughs> the what? I, I would, I would, I would also recommend learning to identify poison ivy so that you, <laughs> you avoid rolling in it or whatever it is you do. Uh, it is it is unavoidable sometimes you know the weed whacker that's the thing i get into it with the weed whacker without even realizing it and then it's game over it's all over my gloves it's all over everything um but hey one you know we we talked about you know the poor the poor impatience the poor jewel weed but the thing that i have noticed at my house is hummingbirds go ballistic over it they yeah, I think I read love that, it yeah. they love it and it's really funny because we've got it right on the edge of the swamp and uh which is kind of on the edge of our driveway and as i drive up sometimes you'll see the the hummingbirds all scatter because i'm coming and they were very upset that i was interrupting their meal at the jewel weed yeah that, they love that that shape of a flower that mm-hmm. tubular shape where they can get their get their beaks in yeah. um, but you know as a plant you you would say it's pretty gangly and you know, yes. wild looking and kind of, you know, yes. something, some, something good for the, for the, uh, the wild side of the garden. Yeah. Or a nice transition plant. You know, if you've got yeah. your garden goes right up to the edge of a woodland or something like that, it would be a great plant to, you know, kind of encourage on the outskirts there for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so a little bit, uh, a, a category that I came up with at the very last minute that, you know, we said feels good, tastes good. What was the other one? Oh, smells good. None of us did smells good, but there's plenty of fragrant plants out I, there. I, 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 did, I did smells bad. Oh, smells bad. All right. Smells yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> um, the thing that I was wondering about is I threw in a host plant at the very last minute because one of the things that I think is super cool um, is just encouraging this idea of not all bugs are bad, you know, and I think we talked about that at the top of the show. Um, and no matter what, any time I ever plant a curly parsley, I get swallowtail caterpillars that come and start basically munching on it and attacking it because it's a host plant for in the east here, swallowtail butterflies. And in the west, uh, I guess it's anise swallowtail butterflies. But parsley is an incredible host. For some reason, it never they never seem to appear on my flat leaf parsley. They only appear on my curly leaf parsley. 
I don't know what that's about, but um, your 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 caterpillars are kind of sewers. Yes, apparently yeah. they like the texture of the curly better. It helps in the digestion, but um, you know, I, and I've gotten into the point now where you know who uses that much parsley in their cooking? Probably not a whole lot of people, but I plant it just so I get the caterpillars. And it's really, really awesome to be able to call, you know, my nephews or even our little neighbor across the street a couple years ago and say, hey, check this guy out. And it's this awesome swallowtail caterpillar that then you can watch, you know, in the usually within the confines of a certain square footage, they will chrysalis so the kids can watch them chrysalis out. And then you can watch them hatch into butterflies. And I mean, that is one of the most interactive experiences you can have in a garden. Um, There's plenty of host plants out there. You know, if there's a particular butterfly that you love, you can generally plant that host plant and they will show up. You know, you plant some milkweed, monarch butterflies tend to show up. Um, And I just feel like that's, that's something that is an easy something that you can do and encourage some interaction with the garden at the same time. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's, that's beneficial all the way around. And I love the, you know, one of the important lessons I think for kids is that, like you said, not all bugs are bad. Uh, if you see a bug, kill it is not, you know, the proper response. Um, and it's, it's cool to let some of them live and to let them know that, Hey, look, these are, some of these are good guys, or at the very least they're doing no harm. Just let it be just, Mm -hmm. you know, let it go. It's not, it's not bothering you. It's fine. Um, uh, both of my children and my wife are deathly afraid of anything that flies, um, because it buzzes. And if it buzzes, it must be a bee. And if it's a bee, it stings, um, (laughs) and stinging is bad, you know? And so they're, they're, they're utterly petrified and they will, they will freak out and be like, Oh my God, it's a bee. When I'm standing five feet from them amidst, you know, a a field of Agastache that's just covered in bumblebees, you know, um, and they're all flying around and they couldn't care less about me, you know, and, and, uh, and I'm like, why are you bothered? It's like, Oh, it's going to sting me. I'm like, look at me. I am, I am in the middle of bumblebees and none of them are bothered, you know, and you don't uh, taste good. The Agastache does. You don't taste good. They don't want you. (laughs) So that's what, whenever, whenever a bee starts coming around and like, you know, hovering around and, and I'm like, you know, my, my son starts freaking out. I just always say, are, are you a flower? Are you a flower? Are you a fl- you're not a flower. It's, it's going to leave you alone. It's going to leave you alone. Um, and by that point he has, he has scampered in the house, you know, and, and, uh, but I think that's an important lesson to learn. It's not uh, enough just to say, Hey, plants are great, but also um, look, there are things that eat plants and that's not a bad thing. And not all bugs are bad. And just because you can squish it doesn't mean you should. Um, yeah. Save yeah. that, save that for the gyp- save that for the gypsy moth caterpillars. Exactly. Yes. I love that. Identify it before you squish it. And now, because everything sounds better with a British accent, here's Peter on the future of gardening. It seems that every generation feels that the one that comes after it is the certain end of humanity. Go back hundreds of years and you can find writings that basically say, Kids these days have lost touch with all that is important. They will be the ruination of everything. Remember what rock and roll was supposed to do to us. Before that, it was bebop. Benny Goodman's swing ran afoul of the older generation for the horror of causing young people to get up and dance in the aisles. And yet everyone turned out all right. Well, if they didn't, it wasn't the music's fault. With our climate changing and the fate of the planet seemingly at a critical point, many of us fear that younger people do not have enough respect or interest in nature. This might be true, but younger people are some of the fiercest advocates in the fight against climate change. And the state of the planet is not their fault. It is ours. But I think everyone listening would agree that the more young people who have an appreciation for nature, the better for everyone and for the planet. Perhaps we should learn from our past. Might our parents or grandparents have had better luck not in putting down our choice of music, but in helping us appreciate theirs and finding some common ground. Instead of saying... Video games rot your brain. Go outside. Try. Come check out this cool thing I found in the garden. If we can make going outdoors a positive experience for them, rather than what's keeping them from their screens, perhaps we have done all that we can do. You know, Danielle, what uh, what is really moving about what Peter said, what really you know resonated with me the most on a very fundamental level, is that um, he went that entire time and didn't insult me once. 
<laughs> I mean, I think we're seeing a kinder, gentler Peter in this episode. Let's see if our expert is as gentle. Hi, my name is David Vaughn. I'm a horticulturalist at the Memphis Botanic Garden and curator of My Big Backyard, which is our five-acre children's garden. Um, and this was a, a really tough decision to choose only four out of uh, so many amazing plants for children. Uh, but my number one is by far uh, Mimosa pudica, uh, also known as the sensitive plant or shame plant. Mimosa pudica uh, is native to South America, uh, so the plant hardiness zones are 9 to 11, but from zones 2 to 8, uh, which includes Memphis, um, it grows as a, a summer annual. We grow it every year as an annual that self sows itself. It has a very kind of sprawling, uh, trailing growth habit, uh, so it's a great ground cover. Uh, it does tend to uh, grow into the taller plants if, uh, if you have it in front of uh, other perennials, but uh, it is incredible for children uh, in that uh, when you touch the leaves, they fold, and children flock to it at, at the Memphis Botanic Garden, uh, and also uh, pretty much everywhere else I've seen it growing. They love to see the leaves fold up, and it becomes an amazing teaching tool for children in that uh, you can talk about how plants have different def defense mechanisms and just see the, uh, the amount of reaction that it, that it shows is, is absolutely incredible. But mimosa prefers to be in full sun. It flowers uh, pretty much from July onward and pretty quickly develops seed heads. I've found that, that deadheading it and, and actually cutting it back pretty severely uh, throughout the summer promotes new growth uh, and helps continue to promote that new vegetative growth, which is what you want. Um, but the flowers are uh, a pollinator draw. Um, all the pollinators are attracted. They're kind of small pinkish purple um, blossoms. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a keeper, um, a really, really good plant for children. My second choice is Saracenia flava, the uh, yellow pitcher plant. It's native to the southeastern United States, uh, growing in zones six to eight in full sun. It is uh, a bog plant uh, that has uh, adapted over the years uh, to grow in, in kind of mucky, uh, nutrient uh, devoid soils by capturing and, and feeding off insects. Uh, so similar to the Venus flytrap, uh, it captures insects. Uh, it doesn't actually move to do so. It just lures them to the, the pitchers by the, the bright colors of the pitchers and the nectar inside. Uh, and then insects go in and cannot escape. Uh, so for kids, it's just a, a really, number one, a really good teaching tool about how plants adapt to meet the conditions that, the, you know, that they're in in their native range. But also, um, it's just amazing to see them uh, sit still and watch with like awe and wonder as insects get lured in. Uh, I've seen some of the most kind of wild and active kids sit still for long periods of time, just waiting and watching for a fly or an ant to kind of walk up uh, or fly up and, and get get trapped in. Um, so so it's definitely a, a winner uh, for uh, for plants with kids. Uh, it also flowers. It flowers in the spring. The flowers are extremely unique. They come up before the new pitchers come up and very showy. It's a perennial in our zone. Um, dies back a little bit in the winter, uh, but but flushes hard really from June onward. So it's a wonderful plant to have in the garden, uh, and the children will absolutely love it. This next plant I've chosen, I've chosen specifically for its incredibly fast growth rate. It's one of the fastest growing plants you can have in your garden over the summer months. And the leaves can get three to four feet long, which are, is bigger than most small children. And it also brings a certain feel to any garden space, a very specifically tropical feel. Uh, and that plant is, is Musa Bashu. Uh, it's the hardy banana. It's a banana hardy from zones five to 10, uh, flourishes in full sun, uh, in rich soil, uh, with a lot of organic matter uh, and a lot of moisture as well. But when given those conditions, uh, it can be an absolute joy to watch, uh, and, a, and specifically a joy um, to watch kids interact with. Uh, and that's because here in Memphis, uh, the hardy banana will die back to the ground in the winter. Uh, and then in March, uh, once all of the uh, last year's growth is removed and cleaned up, uh, the new shoots start to emerge. Usually around mid-March to late March, the new shoots will start really pushing growth. And from that point on, the growth is just exponential. It's, it's, ab it's almost like you're watching the shoots grow in real time. In the past, we've actually gotten out uh, a measuring tape and measured the growth per week. And it's, um, it, it's, it's been from six inches to 12 inches in one week. So for kids to experience that and to see a plant growing so fast in such a short period of time is really neat. 
Uh, but beyond that, uh, once the plants reach their mature height, which is about 15 feet, as they grow, they grow in colonies. So what you're looking at is just this mass um, with enormous leaves. It's almost like a tropical jungle, a uh, tropical paradise for kids. What I've experienced over the years uh, is that uh, there's not quite anything as awe-inspiring uh, as the hardy banana uh, for kids, especially in places uh, where bananas are not typically grown. Um, to see the banana plant growing, to experience the, si the sheer size of the leaves, and then to witness flower later in the season, even if you're not going to actually be able to eat the fruits, to see how bananas form um, is just an absolute delight. So I would, I would put that up there at number three. Choosing the fourth was really difficult. Uh, I think all aromatic herbs are huge hits with kids. Uh, all the mints, all of the rosemaries and basils, chamomile, all of the things that just uh, that, that light up the, the, the sense of smell um, are absolutely huge. But I specifically chose Oxymum species. So um, this is uh, temperate holy basil. Um, it's had a number of names over the years. There's a lot of debate about what to call it now. It used to be called uh, Kapoor um, holy basil. Uh, but right now it is, uh, I think, officially temperate for the moment, temperate ba holy basil. But the, the reason I chose it is... Number one, it's super easy to grow. Uh, it's an annual, uh, prefers full sun, grows in, in a, a wide range of soils, uh, self sows itself every year. So once you have it, you have it. It flowers vigorously uh, and the pollinators absolutely love it. Uh, only gets about two to three feet tall. So it, it's not overwhelming, but it is very vigorous and takes up, you know, takes up a decent amount of space. Uh, but the biggest thing and the number one reason I chose it is that it smells almost exactly like juicy fruit gum. It is one of my favorite things to have in the garden, especially in a sensory garden for kids, because of that reason. Uh, I cannot tell you how many kids over the years have smelled it and been blown away by the similarity. The other thing is it, it's extremely medicinal. It's one of the most medicinal basils in the entire world. Um, it's native to East Africa, but is widely used in India as a medicinal plant. And um, so you have both the aromatic aspect, the fact that it, um, it connects so distinctly to something that kids uh, know and love, uh, a type of gum, which is, which is mind-blowing to them, but also the fact that it, it really leads you into discussion about um, how plants have medicinal value. And I think that that is uh, just absolutely crucial, especially as a teaching tool. So temperate holy basil uh, at number four. I'd like to add an honorable mention if y'all have time. Um, there's so many plants to choose from, but this one's one of my favorite annual flowers to grow here in Memphis. It takes the heat extremely well in our, our hot, humid summers. It also is just incredibly vibrant with, with incredible colors, but also the texture of the flower. I think that those two things really make it a favorite for most kids, and that is um, Solosia argentia var cristata, uh, the coxcomb Solosia. Um, I've grown a number of different varieties over the years. I think Brenda Jordan's air Heirloom is one of my favorite varieties that gets every bit of three to four feet tall. But this is an annual flower uh, that grows in zones 2 to 11. It can vary in height depending on the variety, but uh, the Brenda Jordan's um, heirloom gets uh, every bit of four feet tall, actually, with massive flower heads forming that, to, to most kids, resemble coral. The texture is one of a kind. It's it's very kind of almost like a woolly texture with incredibly bright colors. So oranges, reds, yellows, depending on, on what variety you have. But it's one of those flowers that I think is great for kids because it's super easy. It drops seed everywhere and will come back the next year without having to, to re-sow. It's very low maintenance. Uh, and it's just... Uh, yeah, it's just an eye catcher. I think the the texture itself of of the flower is just one of a kind. I've also noticed over the years that bumblebees in the early morning will have nestled in in inside of the the coxcomb flower, and I think kids get a kick out of that. It's almost like they're they're taking a little morning nap. So uh, so that's my that's my honorable mention. Um, full sun can tolerate a wide range of soils and can tolerate a, a decent amount of drought as well. But coxcomb celosia, definitely a, uh, a runner-up. So I just feel like we should have had David do this entire episode because clearly he picked some amazing, cool kid plants and 
The Memphis Botanic Garden Children's Garden, uh, they call it my backyard, is one of the coolest public children's gardens I've ever been to. I mean, it stuck out in my brain eight years after I was I was actually there. Yeah, the, the only problem with that uh, Botanic Garden, as you pointed out to me, is not everyone there talks like Elvis. <laughs> but thank you very much for listening. <laughs> <laughs>